so this was just the context setting of uh, what we discussed here. And uh, what we want to do right now is uh, talk about the mechanisms and controls uh, that AWS has developed to achieve uh, desired security postures for the workload which are running on AWS. And um, that covers multiple area. So let's start with one of the very important uh, thing that uh, you know needs to be thought through from an initial guardrail or initial setup perspective. Um, so the question is, uh, which is the most secure place on the earth? The secure system on the earth is the system that is never built, right? Um, and what do you do when you build something? The first thing that you build on AWS is you essentially create an account, right? Now that's uh, that essentially is the first uh, border or the first guardrail that you need to think about right from the account perspective. Um, uh, so I'm uh, without going too much into detail of what AWS organization is, uh, my point here is twofold. A, uh, very often, uh, and uh, I'll be sharing more of what we also see in, uh, in the field at times. Uh, we have seen that uh, some of the best practices that needs to be followed in terms of segregation of duties, right? Uh, we talk a lot about it and it's actually starts from the account structure perspective, right? Uh, we have seen environments where uh, part of a production and dev are running into the same account uh, and by nature of it, right? By fundamental nature of the need of the development team versus the need of a production system, they are very different. Uh, the production uh, has to be more uh, hardened uh, production environment has to be more uh, controlled, whereas the dev team needs a better flexibility, right? They want to play around, they want to maybe spin up some resources in a, in a region where there is little less cost. Why not? I mean, you know, most of the uh, enterprise would want to, it's okay to do a development maybe in the US because uh, the, the cost of resources are less. I mean, there are many reasons for that, but that can be one of the reasons. Uh, but uh, you may have some data locality or some other needs which wants you to be be, you know, placed in, in Mumbai. Uh, so what happens is separation of duty starts from the account level perspective. Um, so first point I want to make is have a clear plan when you are starting off, or if you don't have one, there is always a good time to start thinking about how you to structure your workloads from an account perspective. And as you start thinking about that, what you get is a, a very good, uh, you know, set of service from AWS organizations, which helps you define those account structures and create necessary guardrails. Uh, many breaches are that we have seen or many of the areas that we have seen uh, the, the concern happen is actually can be completely blocked out um, by means of a service control policy. Why even have a mechanism to detect something when you can actually prevent it from happening in first place? That doesn't mean you still don't have a detection. I'm not saying that. The only thing I'm saying is, Let's have uh, very strict uh, control in terms of what can something be done in a specific account perspective. So that's that's first uh, point I wanted to talk about. Uh, going to the next uh, is once you have those accounts set up and you log in and you kind of see, okay, I've got like around 170 to 190 services in my uh, menu, right? How do I think about securing them? That's where we say three fundamental things uh, is important. Uh, you need to start thinking about how am I going to, uh, who am I going to give access to and where are my user identity going to remain? That's an IAM. That's the first level after the account. Um, you think need to think about uh, what my data uh, would look like and where all it resides. That's a data encryption. And of course, uh, your network uh, perimeter, um, if you are using native services, uh, you know, how are you deploying them? We are deploying within VPC, outside VPCs, and uh, what is your network layout and VPC layout looks like, uh, you know, subnets, the guardrails, and some of those things. So these are the three important aspects to look into. Uh, once you look at those three important aspects, uh, what we have also seen is, okay, before I go to that point, uh, when we talk about IAM, another pattern uh, that we have seen, I'd like to share here, uh, is that, uh, Imagine you had an AWS organization structure, right? Uh, you would might have created like at least three accounts, one for dev, test, and prod. Uh, having multiple identities in each of these accounts can also be a, a cause of over permission or mis permission or a misconfiguration that can happen. Uh, what we recommend is using AWS SSO. Uh, very few people know that AWS SSO 
as a service uh, has an inbuilt uh, directory service and it doesn't cost so that you can use that to manage the credentials. But you need to be careful uh, over there a little bit. Uh, you know, having multiple uh, identities at even in AWS SSO and then in IAM, it's again an operational uh, overhead to manage them. So a little discipline in terms of when I'm creating users, how am I accessing them? Uh, a good thing about SSO is, is lets you create something known as a temporary tokens. So it takes away one of the attack vector, uh, which is, you know, long-term credentials. Uh, developers uh, would definitely want to play. And uh, when you create an IAM users, you would have access key secrets key, you would take them, you would play around with them. And uh, what if my endpoint got compromised, right? Essentially, uh, that's one of the root of compromise. Uh, so not having a long-term credential is a good thing. Uh, that's what you do with SSO. Uh, and then there are a few services which where you need uh, specific long-term credentials, you need to have a rotation policies around that. Uh, so that covers the IAM and the SSO piece. But again, be careful, uh, multiple accounts having both the strategy in place. Well, you can do that, but uh, you need to be, uh, try to minimize uh, in that case, having number of IAM users and have, uh, uh, you know, uh, all the users uh, onboarded from SSO. Uh, while I do that, uh, uh, I cannot uh, stress any more importance of securing the root account. Um, it's super important. We all know that, but again, uh, it's it's a matter of uh, you know uh, the execution rigor. Uh, you know, uh, it is it is super important that uh, in theory we always say that. And if you ask if you, if you take anybody from a security organization and they'll say, do you you use root? Uh, forget I mean AWS root even on the Linux uh, terminal, right? Uh, people don't log in as root, they use sudo when they need it. They escalate their privilege uh, to do certain things and then they do it and then they come back. That's where you have a sudo or list. When you have that discipline in not giving and uh, logging into your system as root, why would you even want to log in into an AWS account as a root, right? Uh, only when we have those conversations, I think people get the point. Uh, uh, and especially this is for uh, people who are starting off their journey. Uh, it's super important that your root user is essentially locked out. You delegate your billing also to an administrator or a separate user, have a separate billing role and do that. Uh, root should be your break glass, I would say that. It, it uh, or rather not even a break glass, a break glass for a break glass, uh, if that is, a, if I have to put it that way. Uh, never ever should you be using root users, uh, you know, use multi-factor authentications. And then there are different best practices around how do you manage in case of a uh, permission model? Uh, when I come to this, uh, it's also again important that when uh, when implementation happens, right? Uh, implementation happens uh, from different perspectives. So who, where I provision the account from? Is it from a partner? If you have done a self uh, provisioning, some of those nuances do impact how do you want to structure your accounts? And uh, that's a separate discussion, but uh, yeah, it does has little bit of an impact on how do you want to uh, think about uh, um, number of accounts and structuring them. The next thing that we are seeing is uh, once you have your account structure defined, you've got your users and identity uh, taken care of, uh, you then need to then think about uh, two aspects, right? My network aspect and my data aspect, right? And let's quickly talk about data. Uh, now, this is a common trend that we see. Uh, first of all, uh, I will recommend, uh, you know, audience to definitely go and have a look at a data classification, a white paper that is published from AWS. Uh, but uh, I'll summarize the same thing here. Uh, it's, it's more important that, uh, you know, if you have to have an ability to answer these questions, okay, where are my crown gels? What is important? Where all my data resides? Okay, who has access and what level of access to particular data, right? Uh, what controls uh, I have uh, deployed or what controls will I require to meet my compliance need? That beforehand thought process is important. Um, even if you have a workload that is running, it's always a good time to take a pause, 
think through understanding where all your crown gels are or not even crown gels it can be a different data sets which may not be super sensitive but yeah they still need to be protected right um, or nonetheless also knowing what is uh, where does your public data uh, sets right resides it's important is it in s3 is it in ebs volumes uh, maybe it is residing in your database and there are different databases people use right uh, at, at on many places the, the data sets can reside and and when we talk about the data sets here I'm talking of two data sets. A is the customer data or your application data. Uh, your infrastructure related data is also super important. Um, we talk a lot about infrastructure as a code. So where is your uh, uh, infrastructure templates, whether it is a cloud formation or a Terraform templates, where are those template stores? Are your credentials uh, stuffed into those uh, templates? Uh, if so, you know, a visibility onto that. Where are those credentials stores? Uh, this is about provisioning of the infrastructure. The, the first one was about the user data. There is one more type of data. That's your operational data, your application logs. Where are those logs generated? How are you, what is the sensitivity of the law, you know, data that the application is logging? Oftentimes we see that application might log an information. It might log a PII data, right? I mean, uh, what is the masking strategy over there? You may need it for data lineage purposes when you're doing a log correlation, but you still need to have a mechanisms uh, from a logging perspective. Of, of how am I logging my data? Do we have, do you have a common framework for logging? Do you have common format in which developers so you know in a microservices world you will have all different teams doing their own development but it's always good to have that enterprise-wide standard guidelines which says okay be it any application these this is a format in what i want you to log your uh, application logs because then that helps you uh, you know do correlation uh, and i'm sure you know uh, uh, many times i have talked uh, you know to to different team members from a security operations team. And one of the biggest challenge that I have seen, and I've myself done it for a couple of large banks implementation. Um, and, and the question that comes is, okay, we want to have a, you know, a centralized uh, SIM that's what we want to build. But uh, the challenge comes is we are fine with logs because you know Apache logs or an IS log, they have got a standard log format. The challenge comes when the application logs comes in, right? There is no standard format over there. And then if you have to do the you know, correlation, that becomes challenge. Uh, you will see developers maybe logging some very sensitive information and other things. So classify the data from these four data sets and then you know it's time to move ahead. Um, what the next question that comes is, okay, I know where my data is at. I have done my classification, but should I encrypt? Should I not encrypt? What should I encrypt? Um, well, the standard answer and the best answer is to that is encrypt everything. Encrypt data in motion, encrypt data in rest anyone encrypt data when you're using it right uh, and and there are different set of services uh, from aws that helps you achieve each of this at in all the three stages uh, uh, be it uh, you know uh, your tls uh, at alb's and endpoints where you want to have https um, encrypting uh, data volumes and s3 buckets and uh, in your applications, uh, we mentioned, you know, how often have I seen, uh, and, I, and I can tell you a couple of reviews that we do, and we often see that uh, database credentials are stuffed into uh, EC2. We all know that. Uh, so if, the question is this, right? If you ask somebody a question, they will say, no, that's not a best practice, but hey, it's there, right? Um, and that's again, uh, you know, repeating the same thing. It's implementation rigor. It's implementation rigor. It's it's doing the validation. And I think the previous session we were talking about red teams, right? I think some of these things that I'm talking about should be on the radar of the red team. They should be looking for these things. They should be looking for, uh, you know, uh, uh, data from an application logs, logging PI data, uh, you know, uh, the credentials being uh, put into a configuration files or maybe, you know, on EC2 instance lying here and there. Uh, these are the things, uh, as you start thinking through this, right, it also gives you a good input or a use cases for the red team to run through, right? Uh, or maybe when you're just doing a validation uh, within your own environment, um, uh, it's important to run through them. Um, another important thing that I've seen uh, in the environment and uh, oftentimes is that people uh, tend to get a little uh, uh, confused in terms of server-side encryption and use of KMS. And I'll keep it short, but I'll still want to mention that. 
when you're looking at uh, you know, defense in depth from a data perspective, uh, A, first of all, control who has got access from a rule perspective. Um, don't access your data directly. You don't need to go out from the internet and then enter the S, uh, uh, S3 bucket. And this is an example of S3 I'm talking here. Um, there are VPC endpoints. Uh, same is for you know, DynamoDB or other uh, database that you're using. Um, again, um, in multiple uh, you know, uh, discussions and uh, things that have come up is uh, there, there have been uh, misconfiguration of route tables. Um, uh, for another input for a red team, look at your route tables. Uh, they are very important. Route table will actually tell you, is it something what you think it is uh, from a network path perspective? And it's important. Um, once you look at that, um, you know, we want to have all those traffic goes internally and not out from the internet. Um, having a bucket policies, so like resource-based policies and identity-based policies, have a good resource-based policies. And the third and the most, uh, and the fourth one, which I'm talking here is about KMS. When we when we say server-side encryption, what happens is my data, when it is at rest, is encrypted, right? But if for any reason, my key has to get compromised, when I do that, when I get an access, what I get is the actual data because you know it's, it's encryption as rest, but when I'm retrieving it, it's decrypts and gives me the data. And that's, that's, lies, that's where lies the power of using KMS-based encryption. What you do as a best practice is, you do not give, uh, or rather you separate out the roles from an IAM roles perspective, who has access to the decryption keys in the KMS. Uh, so if there has to be a breach, um, first of all, it shouldn't happen, but even if that breach happens, whatever the, the, the adversaries gets is encrypted data. They still don't have access to the encrypted data. And this again is a very, very important uh, thing that we talk a lot about when we are uh, you know, talking to the teams and uh, going through the workloads is that you know, use the separations of duty, have a separate encryption keys, uh, assign a very strict rules uh, on that of who can actually decrypt that. So in case if a developer or something, if, you know, if there is a misconfiguration or if uh, uh, there is a credential theft that happened, your still data is uh, of no use for adversaries who have taken it out. And so this is what I want to cover from a data perspective. Uh, so three things we had, right? We had an account structure, IAM, data, and the network piece. Now I'm, I'm going switching to the network part. When you talk about network protection, what aspect of network protection we need to think about? And these are the questions that comes to mind, right? How do I protect the network? Uh, how do I filter the network traffic or basically have a visibility in my network traffic? And that's where it starts. You, you start with your VPC design. Um, when I talk about VPC design, um, there are again two parts to it. Uh, when it comes to productions, don't use, first of all, delete the default VPC. That's the first rule of thumb. Delete the default VPC, right? Uh, create your own VPC, have a very clear network architecture of how we want the traffic to flow, right? Uh, you have done separation of duties uh, for my production dev and test environment. It's okay if you peer your dev and test environment uh, because you want development freedom over there or people, you want the same set of people who are working on both, that's fine. Don't link it back to your production environment. Keep it different. Uh, once you have done that, uh, have your clear segregations of um, security groups and knackles and some of those things. Once you've created them, remove the permissions from an IAM for anybody to even go and change that. Why there is a need for somebody to go and change the security group? Uh, we have seen use cases where you know, uh, uh, people have written automation around detecting a change in security group and then remediating it. But what if I can in first place not even allow it to happen? So remove those permissions. And if you've got an organization, block it at the SCP level. Uh, once you have done that and you've got your base uh, architecture hardened, now comes your application and you know you want to protect the edge. That's where the set of services that comes from, uh, which is AWS WAF, uh, that's where application firewall. Um, another uh, common pattern that we see is uh, WAF is seen as a, you know, you know, a super thing which will protect your all the web application, which isn't the case, right? Uh, and tell you why. Uh, there are two parts to it. Um, so while you have deployed a WAF and AWS gives you a set of standard rules, right? A standard uh, set of WAF rules, which are there, uh, which covers your OAPs and some of the best practices, it takes care of that uh, cross-site scripting or SQL injection, the standard patterns over there. But essentially WAF is also about 
uh, having a mechanisms where you block some of the uh, or you have some rules which blocks the traffic which are not considered normal from your application perspective that's where spending some time in understanding your application is important what kind of um, url pattern looks normal what kind of url patterns looks fishy uh, um, get into the observation mode look at those patterns and then create a block over there uh, another area is where uh, you've got a, you know a lot of zero day vulnerability from an application perspective that happens right uh, uh, and especially for, for so when you are using an open source libraries right uh, there are like i've been a java developer and i know when i use a maven file and you know people tend to import everything from a maven central which is fine uh, but how many times have developers gone and updated those maven central config files to uh, some of those uh, you know libraries um, the famous one uh, of of 2010 11 is the struts framework is uh, may not be relevant now here but it's still important to know that uh, you know those libraries can have breach most relevant ones will be the Node.js libraries. Um, you've got NPM modules. Developer would use NPM modules, NPM import, and use those libraries, right? Those libraries essentially have vulnerabilities. So while you check about those vulnerabilities in your DevOps pipeline, uh, uh, but what if, you, if there is a, a vulnerability that is detected and you want to block it? Use WAF for that. And, and the reason I'm, again, emphasizing on WAF is WAF is not just set up for default rules. You need to understand your application, your usage pattern, your application libraries, and some of those things. Once you do that, uh, there's next layer of defense. That's uh, so layer, WAF is at layer seven. If you want a higher level of defense at DDoS attacks that happen at layer four, three, four, that's where the shield, AWS shield comes in. And then you've got uh, firewall manager to manage all the rule sets um, for, for managing each of these things, whether it is uh, WAF rules or, uh, or a security group and NACL groups, or also a network firewall. Again, uh, that's a new service, which is now uh, live in Mumbai region. Uh, so essentially, if you have to do any packet inspections, uh, like you know uh, IPS or, uh, or network uh, IDS or network intrusion detection systems, if some of those use cases you have, you can use network firewall. There are different architecture patterns, you know, distributed patterns or single pattern based on how your workload looks like. Uh, you can deploy that and then write a set of rules. Uh, you can in fact import your you know, suricatas or some of the open source rules uh, into this and then you know, look for any specific signatures or patterns that you, uh, you want to put as a guardrail in your network traffic. Uh, so this is, uh, this is essentially what comes from a network protection perspective of what uh, is available. There's another thing that we discussed from our previous session is uh, my detection maturity. So these, what we talk is about, you know, the account structure, the IAM, uh, VPCs and networks. So we, we laid the foundation and we are fine. And we, it's more like a preventive control, setting up the baseline. We talked about that. Another, another thing, other than measure, measure, which is about detection maturity. And this is a famous slide from my colleague, Lalit. Uh, and I really like uh, the way he takes it. And he says, fair enough, that's how the detection maturity looks like, right? Um, so detection maturity, A, no logging. So I think that's where you know people have to spend some time within the organizations and go application by application, because what happens is certain application may be really good in terms of saying, oh, so, so this is how it is, right? The CISO team or a, or a SOC team uh, will have centralized logging. And if you ask somebody, do you have centralized logging? Yes, we do have, it's a chick mark. But how many of your applications are onboarded onto those application logging infrastructure? That's the question to ask. Tell me how many applications are actually onboarded. If they are onboarded, have you done data classification? Have you got a common log uh, format structure where you're able to correlate and see for any anomalies that is happening in the system? Right from no logging to native logging and monitoring, which is available from AWS, but which is more of an infra level, right? Uh, uh, so if you've got you know VPC flow logs, you've got cloud trail, cloud config, so many things that you can do from a monitoring perspective, detect any configuration change or any event that happens, um, any signals maybe from an EC2, we are we return a metrics in terms of utilizations, those metrics uh, we are referring there. And, and uh, finally, we talk about event correlation. Uh, we have got maturity, we have got all logs coming in, event correlation, again, classification is key, standard data format from an application side. Once you have got that level, that's where I will say more of a role of a red team will start coming in. 
uh, are you doing threat hunting are you looking do you know even before we do that do you know what a normal looks like for your application when you have got your application running what does a normal behavior look like what is the user journey uh, right we talk about user journey only from a use case perspective when we are building it but i think uh, when you are looking at it from a security perspective also need to look at what is the user journey or what is the interaction of the user from a system perspective right go through that and understand what normal looks like only when you know what the normal look like you will be able to create baselines once you create a baseline you will be then able to look for anomaly right you will also be able to identify what what comprises indicator of compromise for me if there is a compromise what is an indicator for it because i know my baseline i know this is an anomaly or this is an indicator of compromise i can build my libraries of iocs have those libraries of iocs in your system and then kind of go through the uh, different uh, you know the mechanisms to see if you are able to exploit or if there is any vulnerability go and fix them and finally it, uh, the leg, uh, last step is where you are actually able to deploy deception technology so uh, this is all uh, what is there from a detection maturity perspective uh, and the final stage of all of this is all about log lines how many log lines are you able to correlate and analyze and that's where the next slide comes in is this one um uh, i know it's little um, heavy uh, in terms of uh, the content but it's important because it, it gives you a single view of different log lines that can comes in you have got log lines that is coming from your instances from uh, what is happening at infrastructure level from a cloud trail you have got a network that is flow log that is coming in each of these services kind of move into uh, say a guard duty which is basically a um, network intrusion detection and something more than that it uses a machine learning to identify any anomalies that is happening in your account um, if you got aws organizations enable it at an organization level so it gives you visibility across your account uh, use these uh, you know uh, config inspector uh, these set of services as all of them they feed into security hubs you don't have to kind of look at each of the services and from security hub what you get is uh, uh, also an important thing is there are multiple third party or isp products if you are deployed be it palo alto or checkpoint or any of these right they have got adapters uh, again i'm coming to the standard logging format right so they have got this standard logging format that feed into the security hub Uh, which essentially gives you the ability to kind of correlate aggregate build the alerts based on your cloud watch and if at all you have to push it down uh, to your sim somewhere you can use those flaws this is the, one of the references there are many ways to implement this but i just wanted to say that okay multiple log lines detection can only happen uh, of what you are logging in I imagine in this case right if i am not logging certain aspects say for example i am not looking at the configuration drift which is aws config i am not looking at the configuration drift right you would not know where the breaches happen right so i think uh, each log line has got its own um, you know relevance in terms of which area of in compromise you want to look at and then correlate and have an actionable on that and that's where you know finally you will have an automation of how you want to uh, you know respond to that the response thing i think you also mentioned in the previous session the maturity to do a, a response first where you able to identify and the moment you identify what is the delta from the time that you identify that something has been breached to the time you are able to respond and that's where the automation piece starts coming in uh, uh, just to summarize the last slide that i have here across these domains uh, these are the set of aws services uh, uh, don't have to start using all of them on day one uh, but definitely each has got its own relevance as you start maturing in your uh, uh, adaptation um, but yes the fundamentals which we talk about at the beginning the account structure identity data and network that's how you start with and then you kind of expand from there based on the use cases uh, that's all wanted to cover uh, from a slide perspective uh, i'm open for q and a Okay. So that was quite a comprehensive uh, guide to using AWS and um, you know impl um, imposing security on AWS accounts. Uh, we have Rashid Firoz today from Credit. Uh, Rashid, I would like to ask you, um, what are some of the uh, best practices that you and your team use uh, for AWS security um, when or uh, and like? what do you think uh, startups could uh, learn from you know uh, 
common mistakes that you've seen in the industry with regards to uh, data security? Uh, definitely, uh, Anvisha. Thanks, Ravindra, for a uh, very comprehensive uh, coverage on AW security. I would not talk about the uh, what Ravindra has already talked about because that covers the majority of the best practices aspect. I would want to talk more from a implementation and practical angle where uh, as in uh, I've been working into cloud security day in and day out since last four years and uh, cred has gr grown a lot uh, from a very small company to a, a mid-sized org in the last four years and I've seen a lot of challenges. So I would just want to highlight some uh, very uh, basic and important points that we have to take care of, right? So uh, when we talk about securing our cloud or AWS, uh, it actually depends on what maturity level the org is in currently, right? And uh, we need to keep this in mind that we can't achieve 100% security uh, in a day or even in a month, right? So it is a security implementation is always going to be a continuous journey and it takes time to build a culture of security within the team, within the org and align everybody else that this is the right way to do things. So apart from that, uh, I think uh, viewers also need to understand the shared responsibility model of AWS as what AWS is responsible to secure and what you are responsible for, right? Having a good understanding of these concepts would actually uh, build the groundwork uh, for people, for security teams, for defenders as what they would want to do. Now, to sum it up, I would want to uh, talk about a few of the points that I have noted down. Uh, so considering that you're starting from scratch and you have uh, almost no clue as how to go ahead with securing your AWS account, I would suggest get started with the basics, right? So while creating your architecture, take the help of experts or AWS enterprise support team to start with the security best practices. So Ravindra has already covered on that, right? For example, in a, enable all the relevant logging, enable SSO, enable guard duty, set up alarms, et cetera, et cetera. So in the engineering world, uh, we often talk about tech debt, right? Uh, some backlogs, is what I'm referring to tech debt. So similarly in security, I would also say we also have security debt that I would want to talk about now, right? So as your company grows, uh, your architecture level security mistakes are gonna come back and haunt you, right? And uh, at, after a certain point of time, if you have not uh, done things with the best practices in mind, uh, you're gonna try to fix it by some hacks or patches, uh, which is not as per the best practices. Giving a very simple example, not creating different AWS accounts for different purposes. Uh, there should be different account for UAT, different account for fraud, a different account for dev. This is the best practice, right? If you have not created these three different accounts on different uh, uh, AWS accounts, then it's gonna be a problem for you going ahead. And then migration would again come with a separate set of challenges, changing the VPC structure, et cetera, et cetera. Again, another example on the similar lines could be not enabling SSO for login, right? Creating individual user accounts for employees. It's gonna be a huge, huge pain later on. So uh, to sum it up, uh, my point is basically what I'm trying to say is keep focus on absolute basics and fix it from the ground up, right? If you don't have much clue about it, read AWS Security Best Practices white paper, read AWS Well Architecture Review white paper published by AWS, and you will get enough data as what to work upon. Right. Uh, that was the first point that focus on the basics. If you, uh, if you don't know where to start from, there are enough resources given by AWS itself to do uh, as, as what to do with the best practices. The second thing, what I've observed is, as uh, Ravindra already said, uh, that uh, you need to up your prevention game from start, right? For example, if you look at the data breaches happening around uh, uh, S3 buckets, which is a storage uh, unit, getting public, going public is a major problem, right? Now, if we uh, enforce uh, uh, SCPs, which is service control policies using AWS organization, that no one, nobody can make any bucket public within my org, right? Now, this is also a big problem that nobody can make your S3 bucket uh, public. So you don't have to keep an eye on the, I mean, on the detection aspect of this, that if somebody is trying to make the bucket public, right? So uh, if you try to up your prevention game from start, build guardrails, 
using SCPs or using restrictive IM controls, I think uh, that is going to make your life easier, right? But on the same side, you don't have to loosen up on the detection game as well. So my point is, if you up your prevention game from start, the detection is going to be easier for us because you'd have uh, uh, lesser points to cover. Uh, another thing that uh, I have seen is uh, a lot of times people do not give enough importance to protecting their keys to the palace. So when I mean keys to the palace, I mean uh, AWS, IAM access and secret keys, right? So again, uh, after analyzing all the data breaches that has happened around, even when companies have followed uh, best practices, uh, a big chunk of those data breaches has happened because of a access and secret key leakages. Right? There are tons of ways they can get leaked, but uh, we should give enough importance to protecting uh, our keys, right? Instead of running behind fancy buzzwords and tools. So there's a lot of hype in the security industry, a lot of fancy tools coming up every day in, day out with AI and ML and whatnot. But we need to, again, be grounded and focus on the basics that we have to protect our keys. So a lot of steps you can take for this, right? Uh, for example, minimizing the use of keys, uh, using roles instead of access and secret keys, setting up boundaries where our access keys can be used, uh, uh, upping the detection game if by chance any access keys get leaked, right? So this is one of the important points uh, I would want to convey. The last thing I would want to say is when you uh, when you uh, are acting as a defender in any org, you should never stop thinking like an attacker. And the moment you stop thinking like an attacker, you start doing stupid things. For example, you you somebody might be placing hard coded credentials in an environment variable somewhere in Lambda or EC2 or something like that, right? Because you have assume assume that you can't be breached, so I can go in a hacky way and do this, right? So if you have assumed that you will never be breached, you will keep doing stupid mistakes. So that's why you always have to uh, keep your guard up and assume that one day you might be breached, right? So one thing that has really helped us here is periodic threat modeling of or our crown jewels. For example, let's talk about uh, threat modeling of data stores. So all your customer's data is in some data store and periodic threat modeling of the data store has enabled us to uncover any of the risks that we might see and fix it. For example, you can do threat modeling around access control. What is the access control policy of that data store? Who can get access to that? How do they get access to that? Can they extract sensitive data? Can they not? Right? What, are my, what am I trying to uh, protect? Right? Can I monitor if somebody is trying to extract data out of it? Uh, if it is, is it encrypted? Are there backup policies? Uh, uh, written up, right? Uh, uh, is the logging and monitoring on? So uh, when you try to do threat, regular threat modeling uh, around your data stores, around your uh, SSO or access control, uh, a lot of uh, such things, you would uh, get a understanding from an attacker's perspective as where well, things could lack, right? So again, here you shouldn't copy someone else's cloud security strategy. That, that's not a good way to do that because uh, depending on the scale your org is and what business you are in, your priorities might differ, right? Uh, some things might be right for you, some things might not be. So keep doing threat modeling, identify the risks and fix them. This is, this is a repeated process, right? So uh, uh, just to sum it up, uh, first thing is uh, I would want to uh, say is the first point that I talked about is that uh, if you don't have a clue, if you're starting from scratch, then start with the basics, right? Uh, uh, go with the security best practices, a lot of uh, resources given by AWS to read and understand, and also talk with AWS enterprise support team. They, they are always ready to help you out. Second point I want to talk about is, once you have implemented the best practices, is that up your prevention game from start. Don't, uh, uh, right? uh, don't be uh, in a way that I'm going to do it later, sometime later, because again, it's going to be a pain for you to implement this at a later point of time because there could be some exceptions coming uh, your way. Uh, the third point I talked about is give importance to protecting your keys, right? And take all the steps necessary to make sure your keys are secure. 
Uh, and the fourth point I wanted to make here is that never stop thinking like an attacker, keep doing threat modeling and uncover all the hidden risks and uh, fix it. And this has to be repeated exercise. So I think, yeah, this is what I had, uh, Anvesha, on uh, AWS security.